Chapter 18 of The Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 18 Paulvich Plots Revenge. As Jane and Tarzan stood upon the vessel's deck recounting to one another the details of the various adventures through which each had passed since they had parted in their London home, there glared at them from beneath scowling brows a hidden watcher upon the shore. Through the man's brain passed plan after plan whereby he might thwart the escape of the Englishman and his wife, for so long as the vital spark remained within the vindictive brain of Alexander Paulvitch, none who had aroused the enmity of the Russian might be entirely safe. Plan after plan he formed, only to discard each as either impracticable or unworthy the vengeance his wrongs demanded. So warped by faulty reasoning was the criminal mind of Rokoff's lieutenant, that he could not grasp the real truth of that which lay between himself and the ape-man, and see that always the fault had been, not with the English lord, but with himself and his confederate. And at the rejection of each new scheme, Paulvich arrived always at the same conclusion, that he could accomplish naught while half the breadth of the Ugambi separated him from the object of his hatred. But how was he to span the crocodile-infested waters? There was no canoe near the Musala village, and Paul Butch was none too sure that the Kincaid would still be an anchor in the river when he returned, should he take the time to traverse the jungle to the distant village and return with a canoe. Yet there was no other way, and so, convinced that thus alone might he hope to reach his prey, Paul Butch, with a parting scowl at the two figures upon the Kincaid's deck, turned away from the river. Hastening through the dense jungle, his mind centered upon one fetich, revenge. The Russian forgot even his terror of the savage world through which he moved. Baffled and beaten at every turn of fortune's wheel, reacted upon time after time by his own malign plotting, the principal victim of his own criminality, Paulvich was yet so blind as to imagine that his greatest happiness lay in the continuation of the plottings and schemings which had ever brought him and Rokoff to disaster, and the latter finally to a hideous death. As the Russian stumbled on through the jungle toward the Masala village, there presently crystallized within his brain a plan which seemed more feasible than any that he had as yet considered. He would come by night to the side of the Kincaid, and once aboard, would search out the members of the ship's original crew who had survived the terrors of this frightful expedition, and enlist them in an attempt to wrest the vessel from Tarzan and his beast. In the cabin were arms and ammunition, and hidden in a secret receptacle in the cabin table was one of those infernal machines, the construction of which had occupied much of Paulvich's spare time, when he had stood high in the confidence of the nilist of his native land. That was before he had sold him out for immunity and gold to the police of Petrograd. Paulvich winced as he recalled the denunciation of him that had fallen from the lips of one of his former comrades, ere the poor devil had expiated his political sins at the end of a hempen rope. But the infernal machine was the thing to think of now. He could do much with it if he could but get his hands upon it. Within the little hardwood case hidden in the cabin table, rested sufficient potential destructiveness to wipe out in the fraction of a second every enemy aboard the Kincaid. Paulvich licked his lips in anticipatory joy, and urged his tired legs to greater speed that he might not be too late to the ship's anchorage to carry out his designs. It all depended, of course, upon when the Kincaid departed. The Russian realized that nothing could be accomplished beneath the light of day. Darkness must shroud his approach to the ship's side, for should he be sighted by Tarzan or Lady Greystoke, he would have no chance to board the vessel. The gale that was blowing was, he believed, the cause of the delay in getting the Kincaid under way, and if it continued to blow until night, then the chances were all in his favor, for he knew that there was little likelihood of the ape-man attempting to navigate the tortuous channel of the Ugambi, while darkness lay upon the surface of the water, hiding the many bars and the numerous small islands which are scattered over the expanse of the river's mouth. It was well after noon when Paulvich came to the Masula village upon the bank of the tributary of the Ugambi. Here he was received with suspicion and unfriendliness by the native chief, who, like all those who came in contact with Rokoff or Paulvich, had suffered in some manner from the greed, the cruelty, or the lust of the two Muscovites. When Paulvich demanded the use of a canoe, the chief grumbled a surly refusal and ordered the white man from the village. Surrounded by angry, muttering warriors, who seemed to be waiting but some slight pretext to transfix him with their menacing spears, the Russian could do naught else than withdraw. A dozen fighting men led him to the edge of the clearing, leaving him with a warning never to show himself again in the vicinity of their village. Stifling his anger, Paulvich slunk into the jungle, but once beyond the sight of the warriors he paused and listened intently. He could hear the voices of his escort as the men returned to the village, and when he was sure they were not following him, he wormed his way through the bushes to the edge of the river, still determined some way to obtain a canoe. 
Life itself depended upon his reaching the Kincaid and enlisting the survivors of the ship's crew to his service. For to be abandoned here amidst the dangers of the African jungle, where he had won the enmity of the natives was, he well knew, practically equivalent to a sentence of death. A desire for revenge acted as an almost equally powerful incentive to spur him into the face of danger to accomplish his design. So it was a desperate man that lay hidden in the foliage beside the little river, searching with eager eyes for some sign of a small canoe which might be easily handled by a single paddle. Nor had the Russian long to wait before one of the awkward little skiffs which the Masula fashion came in sight upon the bosom of the river. A youth was paddling lazily out into midstream from a point beside the village. When he reached the channel, he allowed the sluggish current to carry him slowly along, while he lolled indolently in the bottom of his crude canoe. All ignorant of the unseen enemy upon the river's bank, the lad floated slowly down the stream while Paulvitch followed along the jungle path a few yards behind him. A mile below the village, the black boy dipped his paddle into the water and forced his skiff toward the bank. Paulvitch, elated by the chance which had drawn the youth to the same side of the river as that along which he followed, rather than upon the opposite side where he would have been beyond the stalker's reach, hid in the bush close to the point at which it was evident the skiff would touch the bank of the slow-moving stream which seemed jealous of each fleeting instant which drew it nearer to the broad and muddy Ugambi, where it must forever lose its identity in the larger stream that would presently cast its waters into the great ocean. Equally indolent were the motions of the Masala youth as he drew his skiff beneath the overhanging limb of a giant tree that leaned down to implant its farewell kiss upon the bosom of the departing water, caressing with green fronds the soft breast of its languorous love. And, snake-like, amidst the concealing foliage lay the malevolent rusts. Cruel, shifty eyes gloated upon the outlines of the coveted canoe, and measured the stature of its owner, while the crafty brain weighed the chances of the white man should physical encounter with the black become necessary. Only direct necessity could drive Alexander Paulvitch to personal conflict, but it was indeed dire necessity which goaded him on to action now. There was time, just time enough, to reach the Kincaid by nightfall. Would the black fool never quit his skiff? Paulvitch squirmed and fidgeted. The lad yawned and stretched. With exasperating deliberateness he examined his arrows in his quiver, tested his bow, and looked to the edge upon the hunting knife in his loincloth. Again he stretched and yawned, glanced up at the river bank, shrugged his shoulders, and lay down in the bottom of his canoe for a little nap, before he plunged into the jungle after the prey he had come forth to hunt. Paulvitch half rose, and with tense muscles stood glaring down upon his unsuspecting victim. The boy's lips drooped and closed. Presently his breast rose and fell to the deep breaths of slumber. The time had come. The Russian crept stealthily nearer. A branch rustled beneath his weight, and the lad stirred in his sleep. Paulvitch drew his revolver and leveled it upon the black. For a moment he remained in rigid quiet, and then again the youth relapsed into an undisturbed slumber. The white man crept closer. He could not chance a shot until there was no risk of missing. Presently he leaned close above the masala, the cold steel of the revolver in his hand insinuating itself nearer and nearer to the breast of the unconscious lad. Now it stopped but a few inches above the strongly beating heart. But the pressure of a finger lay between the harmless boy and eternity. The soft bloom of youth still lay upon the brown cheek. A smile half parted the beardless lips. Did any qualm of consciousness point its disquieting finger of reproach at the murderer? To all such was Alexander Paulvitch immune. A sneer curled his bearded lips as his forefinger closed upon the trigger of his revolver. There was a loud report. A little hole appeared above the heart of the sleeping boy, a little hole about which lay a blackened rim of powder-burned flesh. The youthful body half rose to a sitting posture, the smiling lips tensed to the nervous shock of a momentary agony which the conscious mind never apprehended, and then the dead sank limply back into that deepest of slumbers from which there is no awakening. The killer dropped quickly to the skiff beside the killed. Ruthless hand seized the dead boy heartlessly and raised him to the low gunwale. A little shove, a splash, some widening ripples broken by a sudden surge of a dark, hidden body from the slimy depths, and the coveted canoe was in the sole possession of the white man, more savage than the youth whose life he had taken. Casting off the tie-rope and seizing the paddle, Paulvitch bent fervently to the task of driving the skiff downward toward the Ugambi at top speed. Night had fallen when the prow of the blood-stained craft shot out into the current of the larger stream. Constantly the Russian strained his eyes into the increasing darkness ahead, in vain endeavor to pierce the black shadows which lay between him and the anchorage of the Kincaid. Was the ship still riding there upon the waters of the Ugambi, or had the ape-man at last persuaded himself of the safety of venturing forth into the abating storm? As Paulvitch forged ahead with the current, he asked himself these questions, and many more beside, not the least disquieting of which were those which related to his future, 
should it chance that the Kincaid had already steamed away, leaving him to the merciless horrors of the savage wilderness. In the darkness it seemed to the paddler that he was fairly flying over the water, and he had become convinced that the ship had left her moorings, and that he had already passed the spot at which she had lain earlier in the day, when there appeared before him beyond the projecting point which he had just rounded, the flickering light from a ship's lantern. Alexander Paulovitch could scarce restrain an exclamation of triumph. The Kincaid had not departed. Life and vengeance were not to elude him after all. He stopped paddling the moment that he descried the gleaming beacon of hope ahead of him. Silently he drifted down the muddy waters of the Ugambi, occasionally dipping his paddle's blade gently into the current that he might guide his primitive craft to the vessel's side. As he approached more closely, the dark bulk of a ship loomed before him out of the blackness of the night. No sound came from the vessel's deck. Paulvitch drifted unseen close to the Kincaid's side. Only the momentary scraping of his canoe's nose against the ship's planking broke the silence of the night. Trembling with nervous excitement, the Russian remained motionless for several minutes. But there was no sound from the great bulk above him to indicate that his coming had been noted. Stealthily, he worked his craft forward until the stays of the bowsprit were directly above him. He could just reach them. To make his canoe fast there was the work of but a minute or two, and then the man raised himself quietly aloft. A moment later, he dropped softly to the deck. Thoughts of the hideous pack which tenanted the ship induced cold tremors along the spine of the cowardly prowler, but life itself depended upon the success of his venture, and so he was enabled to steel himself to the frightful chances which lay before him. No sound or sight of watch appeared upon the ship's deck. Paulvitch crept stealthily toward the forecastle. All was silence. The hatch was raised, and as the man peered downward he saw one of the Kincaid's crew reading by the light of a smoky lantern depending from the ceiling of the crew's quarters. Paulvitch knew the man well, a surly cutthroat upon whom he figured strongly in the carrying out of the plan which he had conceived. Gently the Russ lowered himself through the aperture to the rounds of the ladder which led to the forecastle. He kept his eyes turned upon the reading man, ready to warn him to silence the moment that the fellow discovered him. But so deeply immersed was the sailor in the magazine that the Russian came unobserved to the forecastle floor. There he turned and whispered the reader's name. The man raised his eyes from the magazine, eyes that went wide for a moment as they fell upon the familiar countenance of Rokoff's lieutenant, only to narrow instantly in a scowl of disapproval. "'The devil!' he ejaculated. "'Where did you come from? We all thought you were done for and gone where you ought to have gone a long time ago. His lordship will be mighty pleased to see you.' Paulvitch crossed to the sailor's side. A friendly smile lay upon the Russian's lips, and his right hand was extended in greeting as though the other might have been a dear and long-lost friend. The sailor ignored the proffered hand, nor did he return the other's smile. "'I've come to help you,' explained Paulvitch. "'I'm going to help you get rid of the Englishman and his beast. Then there will be no danger from the law when we get back to civilization. We can sneak in on them while they sleep, that is, Greystoke and his wife, and that black scoundrel Mugambi. Afterward it will be a simple matter to clean up the beast. Where are they?' "'They're below,' replied the sailor. "'But just let me tell you one thing, Paulvitch.' You haven't got no more show to turn us men against the Englishman than nothing. We had all we wanted of you and that other beast. He's dead, and if I don't miss my guess, the whole lot of you will be dead too before long. You two treated us like dogs, and if you think we got any love for you, you better forget it. You mean to say that you're going to turn against me? demanded Paulvitch. The other nodded, and then, after a momentary pause during which an idea seemed to have occurred to him, he spoke again. Unless, he said, you can make it worth my while to let you go before the Englishman finds you here. You wouldn't turn me away into the jungle, would you? asked Paulvitch. Why, I'd die there in a week. You'd have a chance there, replied the sailor. Here you wouldn't have no chance. Why, if I woke up my mateys here, they'd probably cut your heart out of you before the Englishman got a chance at you at all. It's mightily lucky for you that I'm the one to be awake now, and not one of the others. You're crazy, cried Paulvitch. Don't you know that the Englishman will have you all hanged when he gets you back to where the law can get a hold of you? No, he won't do nothing of the kind, replied the sailor. He's told us as much, for he says that there wasn't nobody to blame but you and Rokoff. The rest of us was just tools, see? For half an hour the Russian pleaded or threatened as the mood seized him. Sometimes he was upon the verge of tears, and again he was promising his listener either fabulous rewards or cogent punishment, but the other was obdurate. He made it plain to the Russian that there were but two plans open to him. Either he must consent to being turned over immediately to Lord Greystoke, or he must pay to the sailor, as a price for permission to quit the Kincaid unmolested, every cent of money and article of value upon his person and his cabin. "'And you'll have to make up your mind mighty quick,' growled the man, "'for I want to turn in. Come on now, choose. His lordship or the jungle?' "'You'll be sorry for this,' grumbled the Russian. "'Shut up,' admonished the sailor. 
If you get funny, I may change my mind and keep you here after all. Now Paulvitch had no intention of permitting himself to fall into the hands of Tarzan of the Apes if he could possibly avoid it, and while the terrors of the jungle appalled him, they were to his mind infinitely preferable to the certain death which he knew he merited, and for which he might look, at the hands of the ape-man. "'Is anyone sleeping in my cabin?' he asked. The sailor shook his head. "'No,' he said. "'Lord and Lady Greystoke have the captain's cabin. The mate is in his own, and there ain't no one in yours.' "'I'll go and get my valuables for you,' said Paulvitch. "'I'll go with you and see that you don't try any funny business,' said the sailor, and he followed the Russian up the ladder to the deck. At the cabin entrance the sailor halted to watch, permitting Paulvitch to go alone to his cabin. Here he gathered together as few belongings that were to buy him the uncertain safety of escape, and as he stood for a moment beside the little table on which he had piled them, he searched his brain for some feasible plan, either to ensure his safety or to bring revenge upon his enemies. And presently, as he thought, there occurred to his memory the little black box which lay hidden in a secret receptacle beneath a false top on the table where his hand rested. The Russian's face lighted to a sinister gleam of malevolent satisfaction as he stooped and felt beneath the tabletop. A moment later he withdrew from its hiding place the thing he sought. He had lighted the lantern swinging from the beams overhead that he might see to collect his belongings, and now he held the black box well in the rays of the lamplight, while he fingered at the clasp that fastened its lid. The lifted cover revealed two compartments within the box. In one was a mechanism which resembled the works of a small clock. There was also a little battery of two dry cells. A wire ran from the clockwork to one of the poles of the battery, and from the other pole through the partition into the other compartment, a second wire returning directly to the clockwork. Whatever lay within the second compartment was not visible, for a cover lay over it and appeared to be sealed in place by asphaltum. In the bottom of the box beside the clockwork lay a key, and this Paulvitch now withdrew and fitted to the winding stem. Gently he turned the key, muffling the noise of the winding operation by throwing a couple of articles of clothing over the box. All the time he listened intently for any sound which might indicate that the sailor or another were approaching his cabin, but none came to interrupt his work. When the winding was completed, the Russian set a pointer upon a small dial at the side of the clockwork, and then he replaced the cover upon the black box, and returned the entire machine to its hiding place in the table. A sinister smile curled the man's bearded lips as he gathered up his valuables, blew out the lamp, and stepped from his cabin to the side of the waiting sailor. "'Here are my things,' said the Russian. "'Now let me go.' "'I'll first take a look in your pockets,' replied the sailor. "'You might have overlooked some trifling thing that won't be of no use to you in the jungle, but that'll come in mighty handy to a poor sailorman in London.' "'Ah, just as I feared,' he ejaculated an instant later, as he withdrew a roll of banknotes from Paulvitch's inside coat pocket. The Russian scowled, muttering an imprecation. But nothing could be gained by argument, and so he did his best to reconcile himself to his loss, in the knowledge that the sailor would never reach London to enjoy the fruits of his thievery. It was with considerable difficulty that Paulvitch restrained a consuming desire to taunt the man with a suggestion of the fate that would presently overtake him and the other members of the Kincaid's company. But fearing to arouse the fellow's suspicion, he crossed the deck and lowered himself in silence to his canoe. A minute or two later he was paddling toward the shore to be swallowed up in the darkness of the jungle night, and the terrors of the hideous existence from which, could he have had even the slight foreknowledge of what awaited him in the long years to come, he would have fled to the certain death of the open sea rather than endure it. The sailor, having made sure that Paulvitch had departed, returned to the forecastle, where he hid away his booty and returned to his bunk, while in the cabin that belonged to the Russian there ticked on and on through the silence of the night the little mechanism in the small black box, which held the unconscious sleepers upon the ill-starred Kincaid the coming vengeance of the thwarted Russian. End of chapter 18